Okay, so the time has just passed six o'clock, so we will start uh, tonight's evening meeting. Um, so first of all, I'd like to wish you all a very good evening and welcome you to this, the first second evening meeting of 2022. So as you can see on the slide on the screen right now, tonight's meeting is entitled, tonight's event is entitled Recent Developments in Dynamic Modeling of Seismically Qualified UK Structures. And before we move on to tonight, tonight's event, um, I just want to go through a few things. So first of all, uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Andreas Nilsson, and I'm the current Vice Chair of SECIT, and I'm also the Chair of tonight's uh, meeting. There are a very few housekeeping rules to go over since it's an entirely online event. Um, I want to, first of all, just notify you that the meeting is recorded. And secondly, that questions can be asked via the web interface uh, later on, and we will have a questions and answers session uh, at the end of uh, tonight's event. So we are recording uh, this uh, evening meeting and uh, I should also uh, highlight that we have uh, second has a new YouTube channel on which you can see many of the past um, webinars and lectures and presentations that we have held and we are constantly adding new webinars and meetings to our YouTube channel so it's worth checking out to find it just go to our website second.org.uk and there will be a link on the home page of, uh, of the website. I will to highlight a few future events. So on the 16th of February, young members have organized an event called uh, Resilient Structure, Protective Design Against Theri sorry, Terrorist Threats. And this is an event that will be presented by three engineers from Arabs Resilience Security and Risk Team and one engineer from the same company's specialist technology and research team. So that should be a, a very interesting event. On the 23rd of February, we have a regular evening meeting called Use of Shaking Tables in the Seismic Assessment of Nuclear Facilities in the UK. And this meeting will be presented by Adam Crew, who is a professor of earthquake engineering at the University of Bristol, and Paul Doyle, who is a senior consultant with Jacobs UK. He's embedded into the AWE Technical Authority, and he's also a former chair of SECIT. So he's a, a well-known person in, in, this, um, in this context. So those two events, they will both be streamed as online events only. But from March, we are hoping to resume in-person events at uh, the ICE in London. Later on this year, we have the main event in SECIT's calendar, and certainly the most important event in our calendar uh, in 2022. And this is the 17th Mallet, Mallet Mill Lecture. Uh, it was postponed from last year. It was due to take place in 2021, but because of the circumstances, because of the COVID pandemic, et cetera, we decided to postpone it until this year. And the Mallard Mill Lecture, will, the 17th Mallard Mill Lecture will be given by Professor Julian Bomber, who I think need no further introduction. It's called, it will be, it's entitled Earthquake Hazard and Risk Analysis for Natural and Induced Seismicity Toward Objective Assessments in the Face of Uncertainty. But on to uh, tonight's uh, event. So tonight our speaker is Andrew Thompson. He graduated in 1998 from Cambridge University. He was first employed by Gibbs, who was then later became Jacobs. And one of his early career highlights was to work um, 
at the construction site in CERN when the Large Hadron Collider was being built there. In 2007, he became chartered and he also then joined Atkins. Currently, he's the chief engineer in Atkins and he's working in the ground engineering practice. He's been involved in a range of in, uh, interesting projects such as Wilva, Hinkley Point C, Bradwell B, Sellafield, and various defense clients. And you can probably, if you don't, if you haven't already guessed it, you can probably tell that these are all nuclear uh, projects within the nuclear sector. He's currently living in Leeds. And if you do meet him under more informal circumstances, do ask about sailing on the Norfolk abroads, but don't ask about the recent cancellation of HS2 to Leeds. So without further ado, I want you to hand you over to Andrew Thompson. Thank you. Thank you, Andreas. Thank you very much. And um, it's, a, it's a real privilege to be with you all tonight. Uh, can I just check that everyone can hear me and see the cursor going around on my screen? Andreas, can you hear uh, me? Yes. Yeah, I think that's coming yeah, through yeah. fine. Okay, super. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent, good. Right. Well, without further ado, let's, uh, let's get into the talk. Um, so, dynamic modeling of seismically qualified UK structures. Uh, the, the talk I'm going to give tonight is based on the work that we've been doing over the past few years in the UK nuclear sector, which is uh, predominantly uh, where most of the dynamic modeling of seismic qualified UK structures occurs. Um, so um, let's, uh, let's move on. So just a, a, a brief uh, overview of what I'm going to be talking about. First question, first start with a question, what is SSI? Um, then I'm going to look at the customary approach that the industry has taken to solving uh, dynamic seismic uh, problems. And then I'm going to illustrate how we've advanced uh, beyond that uh, with a, a few examples, looking at 3D modeling, uh, detailed structural modeling, improvements to damping methodologies, map displacement methods, and then talking finally about uh, an example of a piled structure. Okay, so dynamic modeling is predominantly associated with soil structure interaction. Uh, so what is it? Well, it's the phenomenon where the response of the soil influences the motion of the structure and the motion of the structure influences the response of the soil. As a result, SSI modifies the response of the facility being designed. Now, let's take a, a, a base case uh, of, of there being no soil structure interaction. Typically, this would happen if you have a fairly light building sitting on a fairly solid ground like rock. In that case, the rock is not really influenced by the building and can be treated as acting in a free field condition. In other words, a, a hypothetical situation of the same site, but without the building present. Also, the building can be modeled um, as, a, as a fixed base. So, um, yeah, essentially, the the the, the, base, the basis model is fixed. Um, input seismic motions are applied, and that's that. Um, okay, so that's great. Um, why do we need SSI then? Well, we start to have lots of uh, effects um, if if we move away from this simple situation. If a building is partially or fully embedded in the ground, or if it's founded on piles, then the stiffness of the building elements in, inside the ground will affect the seismic motion of the ground. Seismic waves will be reflected, and 
uh, the ground adjacent to the buried parts of the building will be forced to conform to the motion of the stiff structural elements which change the ground motion. This is known as kinematic interaction. So you can see here uh, a few situations where that applies. So as well as embedded foundations, uh, kinematic interaction also affects surface foundations where the flexural and axial stiffnesses restrain or modify uh, the motions of the underlying ground. Okay, in addition to that, if the building has um, a, a small mass, um, then it won't affect how the ground work, how the ground behaves so we can pretend that the uh, the building and the soil are a, a simple uh, harmonic system we have a mass we have a rod with a certain stiffness and the stiffness and the mass are, are basically determined by the soil in this case adding a small building on top doesn't change the mass much if we have a big building um, it will affect um, the vertical and the horizontal response. If we have a tall building, um, the raised center of gravity will mean that rocking becomes a phenomenon as well. And these, this is known as inertial interaction, where essentially we are increasing the mass uh, of the system, and that therefore changes the fundamental frequency of the system and, and so on. Okay, so not only do these interaction effects change the seismic motion going into the structure, they can also change the properties of the ground itself. So by opposing, imposing additional strains in the ground, the stiffness and damping characteristics of the ground will change. This in turn affects the propagation of the seismic waves through the ground and so on and so forth. We can also f see further complications where there are multiple structures in close proximity. The soil structure interaction of one building can in turn affect the response of another. For example, a small building located close to a large building will be affected by the waves coming off the latter. Buildings of similar size clo located close to each other will have more complex interaction. This is known as so structure soil structure or sometimes structure to structure interaction. So SSI can be a complex phenomenon and capturing the full range of its effects requires a detailed understanding of dynamic soil and structural behavior. But why is it an issue? Why are we bothered? Um, after all, soil structure interaction usually reduces the seismic motions acting on a structure. So ignoring it, is mostly a conservative thing to do. If we can avoid getting into complex analytical territory, why not just treat, treat the structure as if it were sitting on a fixed base and not worry about it? Well, unfortunately, or rather fortunately for us who are employed to look into such things, it's not really as simple as that. Firstly, if you're looking at an embedded structure, whether it is a basement or a group of piles, uh, soil structure interaction must be considered. The seismic actions on the structural elements need to be evaluated, along with all the other actions uh, that you would normally apply in order to ensure that the, the structure um, has sufficient uh, withstand. Secondly, while seismic motions overall may be reduced by inertial effects, there are situations where demand can increase. For example, the peak frequency of the response will be shifted and the response at that frequency may exceed the previous uh, response where soil structure interaction isn't accounted for. Likewise, the response of a building on soft soil will generally be less onerous on the structure than the same structure founded on rock. But if the peak frequency shifts, the response of the building will increase over certain frequencies. Furthermore, as, as will become apparent when we look at other examples, there are situations where SSI does increase the overall demand on structures. And of course, there may be significant efficiencies unlocked by considering soil structure interaction. 
in the UK, seismically qualified structures are predominantly found in nuclear facilities. And it's well known in the industry uh, that buildings are usually over-designed as conservatism is implied on top of conservatism. Given the significant and high cost of new nuclear power stations and the competition coming from other power sources, it should be incumbent, I think, on nuclear power clients and designers to pursue efficient designs. And a robust accounting for source structure interaction is an important part of this. Finally, it's worth repeating again that in the nuclear uh, UK context, where most uh, seismic uh, dynamic uh, structural work is undertaken in the UK, the consequences of failure are, of course, as severe. Most UK seismic projects are associated with the nuclear industry. Stringent considerations of risk have resulted in explicit accounting of SSI being a requirement for all nuclear clients uh, for facilities where nuclear safety concerns exceed a certain threshold. And of course, regulators are paying ever closer attention to the issue. Okay, so having established that SSI is necessary, what's our approach? Well, we need to consider a number of things, particularly the, the dynamic loading and response of structures, the dynamic and notably non-linear behavior of soil under seismic loading, and the complex coupling effect between the structure and the soil. But let's for a minute think about what an ideal um, model would be of um, soil structure interaction. Well, we want it to reflect the real world as much as possible. And so we would look to do it in three dimensions. We'd have a fully detailed structural model or multiple structures if needed. We'd have a non-linear ground model that captures real soil behavior. And we had a, have a model where waves can uh, come into the structure uh, to model the seismic uh, motion. And when they reflect on the building, um, they reflect away perfectly and don't don't bounce back. So we'd have a, a yeah, essentially a, a, a model with unlimited extent in the soil. But uh, there are problems uh, with this. Um, and so it has been necessary to produce a customary approach. The, the problems are essentially that the, um, well, till recently, the, um, the, the computational power required to do those sort of ideal models simply hasn't been present. And so we've had to simplify the problem um, and introduce some uh, you know, uh, clever rationalizations uh, to allow us to do the modeling. And typically what that's involved is taking a structural model of um, varying complexity. Obviously back in the 1960s when this stuff first started, the models were very simple. They got more complicated over time. But those models would have various uh, things applied to them uh, in order to model soil structure interaction. Firstly, you'd have an input motion. Secondly, you'd have some springs. And thirdly, you'd have some dampers to, to model the damping uh, and attenuation um, within the soil. Um, none of these is, is without its difficulties, however. And um, initially, um, some, some basic formulae were, were provided to, to calculate these values, particularly for springs and dampers. But as time has gone on, uh, it's proved necessary to uh, do some additional modeling uh, to, to understand uh, better these three inputs. So alongside a structural model, we've also developed a soil structure interaction model. Okay, typically this has been a two-dimensional model to uh, reduce the 
uh, size and runtime. Uh, it's used boundaries to limit um, the extent of the model soil. And sometimes these boundaries uh, are, have been designed quite cleverly to, to allow, um, allow seismic and dynamic motions to exit the, uh, the model uh, without rebounding uh, so that you get a, a more realistic effect of how, how the soil is behaving in reality. Um, as well as that, you have a, a much simplified structural models, um, and I've shown a couple of you know, very crude examples here. You can have a sandwich model where you have a mass in the top and the bottom and um, a, a stiffness in, in the jam bit in the middle, if you like, um, where the stiffness is set to, to provide uh, a, a replication as, as close as possible to the um, to the fundamental uh, frequencies of the building. Um, or you can create a Christmas tree type model where you have uh, beams of certain stiffnesses attached to masses. And again, those are tuned to provide certain frequency responses. Um, but it's, it's far from perfect. Also, you have a simplified ground model. Um, so um, to, to make numerical modeling nice and easily easy, you want a linear elastic model. Unfortunately, the ground is not linear elastic. Um, the, um, if we look at the stress strain curve for a typical soil, it will look something like that. Uh, it certainly won't be a straight line. Um, we start off um, at low strains with quite a high stiffness, which we term G naught for shear stiffness. And then as the strain increases, the stiffness reduces. And then if we want to look at it dynamically, we need to uh, model uh, looping effects. So um, the stress strain behavior works uh, the same in both directions. Um, and as the cyclic load, cyclic motions are applied through uh, seismic loading, uh, we get this sort of behavior where the um, it may start off on this orange curve and then it'll go down this and up and around. And depending on the shear strain, you'll get different levels uh, and different sizes of loops. And then they all, the loops can interact and join each other in, in quite a complex fashion. So as well as uh, variable stiffness, this is also causing variable damping, where damping is the energy uh, taken out of the model through um, um, through through the hysteretic behavior of these loops, where essentially the the damping corresponds to the area um, within these loops. Back in the day, though, it was very difficult to to model these um, in a in a realistic, uh, achievable time scale. So, simplification was necessary. So this is an example of a, a, a plot of normalized shear stiffness against time during an earthquake. So the, the stiffness reduces as the strain increases, and then it gets reset back to its initial value every time there's a reversal in uh, the motion direction. And so you get quite a complex pattern uh, of stiffness. But in order to to simplify it, um, you can take these stiffnesses and take a, an overall representative value of stiffness, which is usually a certain, based on a certain proportion of the maximum strain. So this is how it looks if you plot shear modulus against shear strain. <coughs> this would be the typical curve that you get. Um, you'd run your model. You get a maximum shear strain out for a particular part of the model. You'd then reduce it by a certain proportion. 
and then you'd use that value to look up your new shear modulus. And then you'd put this that shear modulus back into your analysis, rerun it, and you'd keep on doing that until you got convergence. And the same thing would happen with the damping ratio. Okay, so um, all that stuff was developed several decades ago uh, and served the industry fairly well. So what's the motivation for developing further than that? Well, um, sometimes we have nice and easy problems when we have uniform stiff ground, simple building geometry, spread foundations, but then it gets a bit more difficult. Uh, we have horizontal layered ground, intermediate stiffness <clears throat> and embedded buildings. And then it gets really difficult where we have mixed ground conditions with soft soil, complex building geometries, multiple buildings, and especially piled foundations. So let's look at a few examples. Uh, the first example I want to talk about is a confidential project, um, but it's a, a large concrete building on very poor ground. Um, and not only is very poor ground, but it's a mixed ground conditions, which I'll explain a bit more about. The solution to this was to use a 3D model uh, with more detailed structural modeling and also use a fully non-linear soil model. So this is um, this is the, the ground conditions and, and a, a very crude representation of the uh, of, of the building on top. Uh, so as we said, a large square concrete building. Now this this Square buildings are quite um, problematic to model in two dimensions because, um, yeah, ideally you'd want a nice strip, you know, nice, nice long building that you can model a cross section of with the, that you can reasonably approximate as two dimensional. When you have a square building, your end effects start becoming uh, more critical to the overall response. As you can see under here, under the building, we have mixed soil conditions. And we also have an old wall um, that was once a, a dock wall um, that bisects the building diagonally. So this is the building outline in, in, in a crude sketch. And you have this wall running diagonally underneath it. On one side, you've got historical backfill. And on the other side, you have hydraulically placed fill uh, that's uh, silty sand, essentially, uh, and is quite loose in places, so quite soft. So for a number of reasons, we can see that the, the conventional approach uh, to um, soil structure interaction wouldn't have worked here. If we did a two-dimensional cross-section, where do we put the... Um, where do we model the wall? Can we model the wall? <clears throat> so, and of course the, the problem as well with the, the structural model is that never in a month of Sundays are these simplified uh, models going to be exactly uh, the same response as, as a detailed model. Um, at best, you could model the, the peak vertical frequency and the fundamental horizontal frequency, and that's about it. Of course, localized effects are excluded as well. And furthermore, it, on a from a practical engineering perspective, um, coming up with a different model requires extensive validation because you need to demonstrate that you are capturing um, Enough, enough of the uh, mass of, of the or the dynamic mass of the response at the correct frequencies and this can cause uh, well it creates quite a lot of work to undertake um, when you're when you're looking to validate it we can also see that in other cases there are significant drawbacks of, of uh, a two-dimensional approach. This was another confidential project uh, from a number of years ago. 
it had three buildings very close to each other and the um, we ended up having to do um, a large number of cross sections six cross sections as you can see there um, in order to model the different parts of the structure to check what uh, structure to structure interaction there may be um, and so on um, by by the end of this, we were fairly convinced that it would have been quicker and cheaper to have just done a 3D model of the lot. And finally, we are able to substitute the linear equivalent soil model for a hysteretic soil model, where as the uh, analysis progressed, um, the, the stiffness was updated constantly to follow the uh, stress strain curves uh, and given sufficient uh, logic um, to to allow smaller loops and larger loops and for the loops to uh, connect up correctly okay so those were the innovations we we brought to this project and this is the result so uh, just to explain what's going on this is uh, a somewhat more detailed representation of the structure. Uh, it's sitting on a raft foundation, which you can just about make out here. Uh, and this is a, a cut through section of the soil. OK, so underneath th this is uh, going to show us the, the shear strain. Uh, blue is, is zero strain, so it's all blue at the moment. It hasn't started yet. Um, and remember, it's pretty soft soil. So uh, this is what happens when we uh, ran the model. OK, so you can see uh, the seismic waves coming in from the, the base of the model. And you can see there's a tremendous relative movement. Of course, this is uh, many times multiplied in terms of displacement, but there is still a, a rather queasy uh, movement going on of the of the structure uh, and you can see underneath the structure there's a huge amount of strain taking place apart from in the buried wall of course um, okay so um, our eventual solution uh, to this uh, it was decided that this sort of movement and and also static issues and other issues meant that we needed to improve the ground underneath the structure and essentially replace the soil with with uh, concrete uh, to form a, a, a solid block underneath the soil uh, that was founded on the on the uh, more competent glacial till at depth okay so this is a, another video showing uh, what happens when you've got your improved ground okay so the same seismic motions are coming in but you can see that the obviously the the, the concreted area uh, isn't showing much strain at all you can see strains developing around it a little bit but but largely the um the the structure stays stays put and stays intact pretty well um, there are some diff important differences though i will now attempt to run the two at the same time and if you just have a look at what's going on at the roof of the right hand structure compared to the left hand structure you'll see that the roof is vibrating like a drum um, quite a lot more than the roof on the left hand side and that's because on the left hand side the soft soil is effectively acting as a seismic isolator so um, the the soil structure interaction is so great here that you're not seeing that the building isn't seeing a lot of the motion coming in from the ground whereas here it is and that's why i've said that in in some cases it, it's very important that we do soil structure interaction so although that this this allows the 
ground improvement allowed the building to stay intact and put it on a solid base but it did mean that the um, the structural demand was increased okay so let's move on to a second example so this second example uh, removed the issue of springs and dash pots um, and by means of creating mapped displacement. It also improved the damping and improved the structural modeling. So the springs and dampers I've mentioned before that you know, we, we've, we've historically undertaken um, geotechnical analyses with um, various um, with the ground model to various degrees of complexity and a perhaps a simple representation of the building uh, particularly the building mass on top so that we can uh, obtain um, spring values and damping values from the base of the structure in order to feed into the structural analysis but there's problems with doing this so looking at the springs issue, the question is how you um, how you uh, distribute your springs in your model. Uh, so typically at any one point, you could add a, a, some horizontal springs and a vertical spring. The problem is that often the, the vertical springs need to be different for different situations because not only is the vertical spring there to model the vertical stiffness of the structure sitting on the ground, but also in a, acting as as a um, as a couple device, the uh, vertical springs are, um, are needing the um, excuse me a moment. The, the rotational uh, overall stiffness is also determined by the distribution of the vertical springs. Um, so these are showing the two, and if you've got a three-dimensional model, you're looking at doing it in different direct, at, at the, the rotational response in different directions, as well as the vertical response, which isn't shown here. All in all, it means that you end up with some or Canada with some very different uh, distributions. And this looks okay overall, perhaps, but there are key differences around here uh, and so on. And, and in some cases, yeah, the, the, the response is very different. Um, and it's, it's essentially impossible to uh, provide a set of springs which satisfies all the requirements. <clears throat> So uh, likewise, damping um, is quite difficult to resolve when you have a complex model. So um, in some situations, uh, let's say you have layered soil and that sort of thing, uh, damping uh, becomes quite a complex uh, phenomenon to model, uh, but we need to need to model it and, and get a get a feel for it. Uh, extracting um, damping values from a uh, soil structure interaction model uh, can be rather difficult uh, and, a, and a very involved process. So to solve these problems and solve these issues of, of needing to, to validate these inputs um, yeah, and, and spend a long time doing so, we've come up with uh, something we call the mapped displacement approach. So this is when we do our um, soil structure interaction model, typically in FLAC 3D. We record uh, the motions around the structure where it's in contact with the soil. And then we transfer those motions directly into the structural model, which is typically done in Abacus. Okay, so as a result, we're effectively bypassing the need to um, provide stiffness uh, soil stiffness values 
and soil damping values into here because we are essentially replicating uh, as close as possible um, the the motion uh, yeah, in in both models. Now <clears throat> there are some issues associated with this. We'd want this structural model to be as close as possible to the, the structural model here. Okay, so it's important to get, uh, you know, an, if possible, an exact replica. Also, we'd want to model the damping in the structure as close as possible. Now, damping is um, in, in the soil we've already resolved largely by uh, firstly introducing our um, transmitting boundaries around the edge of the model um, and secondly by allowing um, a hysteretic um, soil stiffness um, in the model itself um, that, al that uh, al accounts for, for most of the material damping within the soil. But what it doesn't account for is the damping in the structure. Now, traditionally, structural damping and also damping in the soil has, has used the Rayleigh damping approach, which combines a, a stiffness uh, dependent component and a mass dependent component, combining the two together to form this, this red line, which provides uh, damping. But as, as you can see, it's not very constant over um, over a large frequency range. So it's always difficult to try and target it properly, uh, particularly when you're dealing with a structure uh, that has a wide range of important frequencies. Furthermore, we can see that at low frequencies and high frequencies, the damping gets very high, higher than we'd reasonably want. Uh, higher than is realistic and is therefore potentially unconservative. You can get round this by setting the damping a bit lower, but then that uh, you, you're under damping the key frequencies and um, you know, it, it's, uh, you, you end up uh, introducing a conservatism. So um, what we've done recently in, in the past couple of years is to introduce Maxwell damping into our soil structure interaction models. So this is a different formulation where Maxwell components of damping are added um, to uh, the stiffness of the material. Where our Maxwell component is um, a viscous damper and a, and a spring in series. These are tuned individually uh, to give um, certain damping values over certain frequency ranges, as you can see in these three um, three lines here, and combined, they form a really nice, um, almost flat uh, line over quite a large frequency range. Certainly, um, the sort of the sort of range of frequencies that we'd be interested in for our modeling. And furthermore, the damping reduces uh, at high and low frequencies rather than increases, which means that this is automatically conservative. We've also looked at improving the structural detailing. So we got to the stage where we were able to model um, you know, the, the, the mass and the, and the frequency uh, content of of the structural model within the geotechnical model but there's always been a need to do a lot of validation to make sure that the geotechnical model is um, performing overall in the same way as the structural model what we've been able to do recently is transfer lock stock and barrel all the details of the structural model into the geotechnical model so these two um, this is this is a very recent example um, of a 
uh, a nuclear structure um, and it um, yeah, the geotechnical model is is modeling the exact um, replica of, of the structural model so every beam every shell element is replicated um, and that's a huge improvement in terms of being able to validate uh, our analysis because it means we can we, we no longer need to uh, engage in in you know, long validation processes to <clears throat> to confirm that our geotechnical model is modeling the structure in the same way as the structural model um, you know, no longer different but similar outcomes they are basically the same moving on to our third example uh, piled foundations now piled foundations are not precluded in nuclear um, work and certainly not precluded world, world <coughs> worldwide in uh, seismic um, geotechnics <coughs> however um, there have been some significant caveats to this uh, the IAEA um, recommendation says owing to the complexity of pile design option of deep foundations is considered as a last resort um, pile design is specifically not covered by ASC 416 which is considered to be the most recent uh, um, recommended good practice and a total of one page um, of Eurocode 8 part 5 is devoted to piled foundations. Nevertheless, in the UK, there are um, instances of significant uh, structures in the nuclear industry which are founded on piles. And this is an example of one of them. This is at Hartlepool Power Station. It's founded on a rather complex um, series of 17 piles forming two concentric circles. Um, none of this is, is particularly regular. Um, th there's, there's, it's not symmetrical. Um, it's not, um, uh, not, not easy to analyze. Of course, the problem with piles and it, seismically is that every pile potentially is interacting dynamically with adjacent piles. The closer the piles are to each other, the more the chance that they are interacting strongly. So particularly around this inner ring, we would expect quite strong interaction with perhaps less interaction around the outer ring. OK, so we needed to uh, adopt a method uh, for looking at this uh, pile interaction. Um, the the process we adopted. Okay, so the 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 method adopted uh, for looking at this complex pile group um, was essentially um, we we decided to provide the. Uh, the structural analysis, which sits on top of this circular raft with springs and dampers. And the way we went about it was to uh, prescribe a certain motion on this raft. And we then, um, and, and th this is the motion that you can see here. So that it was a cyclic motion that built up to a, a steady state sinusoidal uh, motion. And those were done at various frequencies, so we can see uh, what the frequency dependency of the stiffness and damping was. The damping and stiffness were evaluated from uh, the response uh, as follows. So we monitored both the, the displacement uh, of the raft and also we summed all the forces that were applying in different directions. Uh, that were resulting from the the motion that we prescribed. That resulted in a um, in a loop uh, 
uh, being formed at, uh, at steady state. And uh, once again, the loop is effectively a hysteretic loop. Uh, the area inside forms the damping component. Um, and where you get the maximum displacement, the stiffness is defined as the gradient uh, along this line. So that enabled us to, to essentially map out for lots of different directions, horizontally, vertically, and also rotationally, um, the uh, stiffness and damping components of this large pile group. Now, we didn't go straight into, into modeling the group. Um, um, first, we needed to do some validation. So we started off doing just a single pile, which we had um, yeah, there, there's various publications, including Gazetas and NIST, um, had um, you know, published results uh, for this sort of uh, response. We compared our results, which are the diamonds here, against those, and we can see that in both stiffness and in damping, we were getting a good response. Um, although the some of the NIST results we we concluded were were somewhat out. We then uh, moved on up to a simple pile group. Uh, so this was a three by three pile group. Again, we had some um, published uh, data on this uh, uh, and we're attempting to replicate it. So we, you, the eagle eyed among you will see that this is a uh, modeling a half pile group making use of the symmetry. And again, we got a, a reasonable response, pretty good response at most frequencies. Some frequencies were a little out. And then we moved on to the the full damping, sorry, the the full um, the full model. Um, and this was the result. So we could see that there was a high frequency dependency, including quite significant drops down to zero or even negative stiffnesses at some frequencies. So um, we were able to compare this to uh, legacy reporting, uh, which was uh, good. What's a negative stiffness? How on earth do you get negative stiffness on a, on a pile group? Um, well, what was happening was some very complex interaction. So again, this is obviously a, a massively scaled up um, uh, displacement plot. But in, instead of this sort of response, we were seeing that the response was almost a perfect ellipse. Now that implies that, that almost all the response from the uh, pile soil interaction is happening in terms of damping and you've got very little stiffness. <coughs> Excuse me. In fact, the, the peak uh, displacement was happening at a negative load. So because of the complexity and because essentially the you know, most of the pile was moving backwards while the pile cap was moving forwards, you got this odd behavior. Um, and, and in some cases you were pushing into a, into a negative stiffness territory. But essentially it was, yeah, you know, the big story here is that it was mostly damping going on. We also investigated gapping behavior uh, this was done as a separate model, which the results were then fed into the previous model. Um, but this also gave us some some uh, good information and it allowed us to do quite a significant amount of uh, sensitivity assessment, looking at different lengths of gaps, uh, different different depths of gaps, sorry, over over different frequencies, uh, which produced some interesting results. Uh, and we could superimpose that on the um, the frequency responses for uh, different stiffnesses of soil as well. So it enabled us to do a, a lot of sensitivity analysis, uh, which is fed through into, into the safety critical work uh, taking place. Okay, so to to sum up very briefly, um, the computational power that we now have available as engineers enables us almost to do fully integrated models. Um, most of the uh, 
uh, difficulties uh, have been overcome. 3D models are now essentially standard. Uh, Time-based nonlinear stiffness and full modeling of damping um, in both the structure, the uh, soil and, and in terms of radiation damping are possible. Uh, we've been able to massively simplify validation processes due to our ability to copy over from one program to another, uh, the result of um, you know, digital initiatives. And our pile analysis is developing strongly, although it's fair to say we're not quite there yet in a, in a fully non-linear soil uh, with a full pile model uh, allowing real-time gapping uh, under a time history analysis. But I'm sure we'll get there. Okay. Um, I would like to thank uh, a number of my colleagues uh, listed here. Um, we've got a great team of people, and um, yeah, they they deserve to be uh, to be acknowledged. Okay, so I think that that is that. And uh, are we are we moving into questions, Andreas? Yes, we are indeed. Um, so now I would like to encourage all attendees to submit their questions through the interactive, um, whatever it's called, facility you have in your web browser. There should be a little window beneath the presentation window where you can submit questions. And um, once we do get any questions, then I will read them aloud and take them one by one. So I guess <clears throat> while we wait for the first question to come in, I, I could probably start by asking, in, in terms of the map displacement approach you outlined previously mm. in the presentation, what do you do when you have discrepancies in the mesh? So where a node in your flat model does not correspond exactly to a node in your abacus model and or vice versa. And what do you do, for example, if the mesh in the flat model is coarser or there's greater distances between the nodes yeah. than there is in the, in the abacus model? How do you map the two components across? Hmm. Okay, so, so there, there's essentially two issues there, I think. The first is um, the, the difference between the, let, let, me, um, let me share screen again. Yeah, so so here we have we have the the structural model and the geotechnical model. So until recently, um, we have uh, essentially uh, the the geotechnical model has been a cut down, simplified version of the structural model. So not as much detail. Yeah, you know, the the broad structure is there, but but not in as much detail. So what's what we've needed to do is where we have the displacements coming out of the, or the, you know, the motions coming out of the geotechnical model, uh, we've developed um, uh, methodologies effectively to interpolate between them. So the, 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 the mapping in the map displacement is, is essentially, you know, if, if you have, um, you, know, you, you have, you have, I'll use my fingers. <laughs> you, you've got your two two geotechnical model nodes here, but then you've got a series of nodes in between. Effectively, you, you do an interpolation exercise. And of course, it's not just in 1D, it's in 2D as well, because yeah, lo looking at the, the interface. Okay. Sure. However, um, the, this most recent model that we've done, um, because it it takes it takes the structural model lock stock and barrel and imports it into the geotechnical model so that means that we no longer have to interpolate we simply have you know the node is the node um, and we have a one-to-one -one correspondence what that does mean is we have a heck of a lot of nodes so this model for instance had around seventeen thousand uh, nodes to export um, each node containing uh, a time history um, 
multiple models because you have different yeah you have a whole yeah uh, uh, i think in this case we had five different time histories you've got to look at all three orthogonal directions and so on it becomes a massive data exercise but in terms of validating the model and so on um, there's a huge advantage so okay. the the second thing you asked was how we um what then happens between the geotechnical model and the structural model? Um, so we develop again. We develop processes that that provide um, yeah, effectively a, a yeah, that, that link the two together um, within the flat three D model. We've developed a process that that allows um, non congruent uh, meshes uh, to be connected together. Well, thank you for that answer. In the meantime, we've had lots of questions and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I do hope that we have time to go through them all. Mm. We have many, also many comments who thank you for an excellent uh, presentation. Oh. Um, the first question comes from John Inkister, and I hope I get that right, um, from Southwave Consultancy. And he asks, you spoke about amplification of forces due to SSI. When does this occur? Okay, so um, it, 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 I think it, it generally occurs when you get a strong um, match in, in terms of frequency um, between your, your structure and the soil um so um that that's speaking in very general terms but um yeah it 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 tends to yeah and any any system will have a, a it, its natural frequency um and soil structure interaction uh, let's say it, it if it reduces reduces the stiffness of your um, of the soil underneath it during a seismic event and also increases the overall mass of the system that will shift the frequency um, the, the, the fundamental frequency of the system down um, now it may be that the, um, the the peak acceleration response is still maybe lower than without any soil structure interaction present um, but it may be at a frequency that is more critical uh, to, to, the, to the model. So, for example, I, I, th I think that's probably what is happening. If I can just move back to my example. So where we where we saw this, um, the, the roof of this really driving up and down. Um, that was likely you know, it, it's not it's not the overall building frequency response but it's a particular frequency that's affecting the roof and is therefore causing uh, you know, significant effects due to SSI okay thank you uh, the next question comes from what I think is one of our German colleagues um, his name is Veselin Tsarev, and again, I apologize if I get the pronunciation wrong. His question, however, is, uh, do you have an interface element, or do you have interface elements between the soil and the pile or building in your models? Uh, the answer is sometimes, <laughs> I'm afraid. Yes, so um, the... Um, the way we went about it was, you, let, let me just get to uh, get to this here. Yeah, um, quickly share. Okay, so when we were modeling the gapping behavior here of the pile, um, we were using um, interface elements, as you can see there. You know, to to create the gap so yes that was an interface element with with uh, gapping logic however this was essentially a pseudo static um, analysis um, you, yeah, you can also see gapping under here 
but yeah essentially it was a pseudo static analysis that we then fed into our dynamic model so we did a lot of um a lot of sensitivity analyses to see you know how much the depth how much that gapping depth changed um but yeah i mean in in terms of in terms of uh, surface models like the the model i just showed uh, before um we often we don't tend to use um um yeah we we yeah we don't use interface elements too frequently um because we do a sliding check to to demonstrate that there's that, that there's no kind of movement in that regard so the next question comes from Mahia Setin, uh, who appears to be based in Istanbul as a research assistant. He thanks you for a very good presentation. Have Thank you ever you. considered the effects of surface waves like wave passage? Mm. So I think so, that I'll, I'll let you answer that. Question. Yeah, yeah. So the the um, we most modeling that we do tends to uh, look at waves propagating from the base of the model um, and that is that is standard practice um, so you you don't get surface waves coming into the model but the model itself due to the inertial interactions and so on does produce surface waves um, so I, I didn't include them, but we have some some nice shots showing. Yeah, um, so I, I'm using my hands, but not showing my screen. Sorry. <laughs> I was doing that, but without <laughs> any screen share. Um, yeah. So I mean, the, I, I think one of the one of the tasks in in the future is is to have uh, inclined yeah, incoming waves and that sort of thing that that would pick up the surface waves. Um, yeah, what we've done, you know, it, it tends to be an issue if you've if you've got two buildings that are very close to each other, yeah, you know, adjacent to each other, and you need to introduce a seismic gap between them. And to size that seismic gap, you need to understand what's happening with the surface waves. But we've tended to do that using um, hand methods in, in a fairly simple but robust way. The next question is from Ollie Kelland, who is a graduate civil engineer with McDonnell. And first of all, he says, great talk. And then he asks, you say almost computationally possible. Is that local computing or cloud or supercomputer? It's uh, local computing. So yeah, uh, I, I think if, if um if if we i mean what one of the problems we have is is that uh some of the work we are be, be um <laughs> i have to talk around this issue a little bit some of the work we do is is obviously for uh projects uh, that have um certain security ratings uh and that uh, are difficult to uh put on uh cloud computing and that sort of thing um yeah also our, our software providers uh are, are working on it but I, I don't think are there yet but yeah i mean in, in theory you know, the idea would be that you can get on the cloud and just grab whatever computational power you need but yeah i mean we're, we're basically working on yeah you know, uh, high-end kiosk machines um but um what one rule of thumb that i am adopting is that no matter how, no matter what improvements we make, no matter how uh, how much faster we can run our models, um, that there's always a requirement to add something else into the model. And so, whatever you do, the model always takes four or five days to run, you know, irrespective of of um, you know of, of the leaps and bounds that um, that computer power has has made. Thank you. The next question comes from Christopher Howie, who is a chief engineer with Jacobs. His question is, 
how extensively has maximal damping been used in the field of SSI? And how is it then, I think, is it then received by the regulatory community? Okay, so we've we've used Maxwell damping um, on two or three live projects uh, now. Um, one uh, civil nuclear project um, and one defence related nuclear project. Um, the latter um, has yet to go to the regulator, so it's still yeah. You know, the, the work is in process of, of being reviewed by the client and the regulator. So I, I think the short answer is we, we don't know how the regulator will respond. Um, but yeah, as, as with all these things, it's it's a case of demonstrating that you've, you've done the work robustly. Um, and also I think the, the, the advantages of Maxwell damping are such that um, yeah, it, it's it's inherently more conservative uh, and more reliable. Um, although there are yeah, there, there are a few uh, intricacies uh, and details that that do need to be demonstrated and ironed out. Thank you. I should say that by now we have so many questions uh, that really. I don't think we will, there's any point in submitting any more questions. I don't think we'll get to the bottom of them. Uh, but we have plenty to choose from. And the next question comes from Benali Ghosh, who is a technical director with Mark McDonnell. She, first of all, thanks you for the presentation. And then she asks, can you please elaborate on the pile modeling, especially against lateral loads? How did you calibrate your group model behavior? Okay. So we're talking about this, yeah? I believe so, yeah. yes. So I guess the question concerns um, how you went about, well, in, in Bernali's words, calibrating mm. the model. Okay, so it, it was calibrated against published data uh, for for a, a single pile and then uh, a pile group um, that there is you know be, be, because pile behavior is is complex uh, and difficult to model and no pile group is the same it it's it's difficult to calibrate this exact arrangement um, against yeah the the, the yeah the, the, there's no sort of publications and so on that, that that really allow calibration against this so yeah hence why we started with the the single mo pile model and then the multiple piles and then moved into the into the actual pile arrangement so that it, it was essentially that progression um, that we used to calibrate and of course we had we had previous data from the legacy report so we given that was not frequency dependent uh we of course didn't expect there to be uh, a perfect calibration but the fact that it intersected at, at yeah that it was in a reasonable ballpark yeah over a reasonable frequency range gave us some confidence the next question comes from Sam, Sam Wang, who is a senior associate with Jacobs. And Sam's question is, hi Andy, for pile modeling, have you compared different modeling techniques, i.e. solid elements versus shell versus pile element in FLAG 3D in terms of runtime and accuracy of the results? Uh, the short answer is in 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 this case yes i mean th this was we, um i think we 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 tested various options in this case we've uh gone for uh solid elements um previously we've used um we we've yeah we we've used um uh, shell structural elements um particularly for for offshore monopiles and that sort of thing um 
But yeah, I mean, it, in in this case, we we were initially looking to do to see if we could do um, a fully integrated model. So with with um, you know, running it on a time history basis with um, um, you know, real time development of of gapping through um, interface elements and and so on and so forth. Um, but it, it's it, it was a case of of what was commercially viable um, for the client uh, to undertake and you know the, the point was that that this was <clears throat> this was working alongside a whole load of other uh, sites where which were founded on on more standard foundations uh, raft foundations where it was a lot easier to to produce um, springs and dampers or a lot yeah, we, we could use it, you know, conventional published techniques to do that. Um, so it made sense uh, to to adopt this to fit in with the overall uh, scheme. We have a question next from Carrie Clinton, who is a senior geotechnical engineer with Sellafield Limited. And Kerry's question is, are you happy that soil boundary conditions are properly represented in the models? Um, reasonably so, I would say. Um, let, let's just move to, to where, where we're, what are we talking about? Yeah, just uh, excuse me a moment. Okay, so I, I think we're talking about yeah, the, these boundaries here, yeah? I believe that's the question, yes. Yeah. So, 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 yeah, I mean, the, 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 the boundaries work as, as dampers, um, which are tuned so that they allow um, pretty much all uh, reflected waves to, to effectively transmit through them and not come back again. So that's opposed to having a you know, solid uh, boundaries where which would reflect back. Um, I mean, sometimes you have connected boundaries on the the left and right hand side, so that um, waves transmitting through here sort of reappear on this side and that sort of thing. And there's been various workarounds been done over the years. And of course, the other alternative is just to have a massive ground model that that's you know. Um, several hundred meters a thousand meters away and by, by which time any reflected waves will have dissipated um but it's um it it works pretty well that there, there are known issues with it particularly when you've got uh, angled waves coming into it um but i would yeah the there are always ways to demonstrate that that's not an issue so you know by good practice by moving the boundary um you know, doing sensitivity checks uh yeah. to to confirm that the the boundary position isn't significantly influencing uh the outcome of your model it is telling though that we're still using an absorbing boundary that was first proposed was in 1969. 69, yes. Uh, and we haven't, <laughs> yes. Despite extensive research in the area, mm. there hasn't really been any new models forthcoming in the commercial mm. software that we have access to. Yeah. Although I think, I mean, there are new models out there. Mm. Um, but yeah, you're right. I mean, they haven't been um, really pushed in, into the commercial sphere yet. Yeah. And and may you know, do they need to? If if the you know, if uh Leisman and Kulameyer's work has stood the test of you know it, it it's uh it's a bit like Victorian buildings. We we look at Victorian buildings and say, didn't the Victorians build great buildings? And of course we're only looking at the ones that have stood up <laughs> for a hundred more years. <laughs> um so yeah, in in a way, you know, yeah, I mean it's it, it's it's a process that has stood up well yeah um and it's the, the, if it works don't fix it paradigm yeah 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 um yeah what what problem are you trying to solve at the end of the day by by replacing it okay i think i think we're going to take three more questions and then we'll we'll call it a day i'm 
I deeply regret we don't have time to answer all the questions. There are okay. still um, 20. I, I will need to leave in, in a very few minutes. Oh, okay. We'll take one more question then okay. uh, before we, we wrap up. Um, and um, the next question comes from Karim Aljawari who is a PhD candidate uh, in IUSS Pavia in Italy. He's, his question is, thanks a lot for the amazing presentation and the effort. I would like to ask, is it possible to, to develop detailed structural models where beams, columns, and walls are explicitly modeled so that we can inspect their internal forces and combine them with soil models? Or would this be beyond be beyond available computational power? Um, I, I, that's a really good question. Um, I'd, I'd say that, that uh, no, it's not beyond available computational power. Um, it's, it's simply a case of the, the, the commercially available software that we, that we have can do a decent uh, structural model. Uh, let me just share this screen again. So these these two models here, this is the structural model in Abacus. This is the geotechnical model in FLAC 3D. They are structurally equivalent. So every single beam in and shell element in that makes up this model is replicated here in exact detail. Um, however, it, it is simply a case of convenience, I think, for the structural engineer to work and, and get output from Abacus. So you can get output from uh, FLAC 3D structural models, but it's a little more complicated. Um, and you know, that and, and involved, um, but that's really the only thing that's stopping it. And uh, you know, obviously, the holy grail I think is to have this combined structural geotechnical model, where you've got everything in one model. Um, and yeah, you know, that that's that's what we're aiming to do. Well, Andrew, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Uh, I would like to thank you. Um, on behalf of SECIT and moreover on behalf of the audience. As I said, there are many, many comments uh, in our inbox that um, extends sort of thanks for the excellent presentation you've given tonight. Thank and you. And I know you've been very busy uh, in recent weeks. So uh, again, also thank you for taking the time out of your, your diary to, to present to us tonight. Um, with this, uh, I'd like to call the uh, event to an end and um, just remind everyone that the, tonight's presentation has been recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel and I think it will also be available through the ICE. So if you go and search for the event in a few weeks or days time, you, you can find it and watch it again. So, okay, that's all for tonight. Thank you very much and uh, have a pleasant evening.